are now going to start uh, day two. And we are going to discuss or present two articles before you. Uh, article number six on uh, undermining JNU's anti sexual harassment policy and the manner in which the Vice Chancellor of JNU has dissolved GS Cash. Article number seven. <coughs> would be presented to you uh, soon after this, which is on uh, Najib Ahmed's disappearance and uh, the callous attitude that the Vice Chancellor of JNU has shown in uh, dealing with this, with this case, with the disappearance of one of our students, Najib Ahmed. It's been more than a year now, but the university has not done anything to trace the whereabouts of Najib Ahmed. So that we are going to deal with in Article 7. Uh, for today's hearing, we have got a list of uh, eminent personalities consisting of journalists, lawyers, activists, filmmaker activists, uh, I'd like to uh, invite them on the stage. Uh, Rahul Roy, who is a filmmaker, is based in Delhi and also written a book on uh, masculinities. A uh, little book on men. He's also a, uh, a prominent filmmaker and has made, made films such as Majma. The City Beautiful and When Four Friends Meet. Uh, we also have uh, another uh, very prominent uh, journalist writing in Hindi, Basha Singh. Basha Singh has been uh, one of uh, JNU's well wishers, and uh, whenever we have requested her to uh, uh, speak in various platforms in JNU, uh, she has uh, graciously accepted our invitations. Basha Singh also a journalist, writer and activist and a recipient of the Ramnath Goenka Award uh, for based in the journalist in 2007. She's also written a very interesting book on uh, manual scavenging women, Unseen India. Uh, third juror is uh, Kalani Menon Sen. She is a feminist activist and writer. Uh, the fourth is uh, Sayat Mahmood, uh, who is an advocate of the Supreme Court and who practices constitutional law, human rights, and civil liberties. Uh, the fifth juror is uh, T.K. Raj Lakshmi, uh, a senior journalist and uh, former president, senior journalist with the front line and the former president of Indian Women Press Corps. She will uh, Uh, may I now request our case uh, presenters on behalf of Jainuta, Dr. Avinash Kumar, uh, Professor Sachidanan Sinha, uh, Dr. Chirashi Das Gupta, and uh, Dr. Moshmi Basu. Please come up on stage and have your seats. After the articles are presented by 
by your uh, guest presenters. We will then request uh, Dr. Amitabh uh, to defend the VC's position, which is indefensible, but we'll have to, uh, uh, as, you, as you've seen since yesterday. Uh, so, uh, and uh, let me also make a couple of announcements. After the program is over, we'll also have a musical program. I mean, uh, what we call protest music to be presented by uh, Sumangala Damodaran. Uh, these are our this evening's proceedings. Now, may I request our teachers, teacher colleagues, to present uh, articles. We'll begin with Article Six. That is. Good evening. If you look at the ambience here, one of the things that may strike you is that there is an invisible culture of surveillance that is continuously haunting all constituents of the university. So one of the things that under the present administration we've seen, which is new in JNU, is a culture of impunity around surveillance in the name of security, where teachers and students are regularly filmed and on the, on the premises of the institution without their consent. And then the university uses this footage for various things, including punishment. But one of the important things to note here is that the, we are told that the university security has just one camera. And all the rest of the filming that happens is on personal mobile phones and other devices of people who are informally instructed to film different people under surveillance as and when they wish to. Now this is one of the greatest contributions of the present Vice Chancellor in creating an extremely unsafe environment on campus and especially in undermining JNU's anti-sexual harassment policy. But there is more, and this is only a small part of what has happened since this Vice Chancellor took office. The Vice Chancellor, as we all know, has initiated and led the process of the attempted illegal dismantling of GS Cash, JNU's well tested and universally acclaimed institutional mechanism for dealing with the problem of sexual harassment. In this, he has sought to misuse a UGC regulation to replace it with what is called the Internal Complaints Com Committee or the ICC, over which he can exercise control through his nominees and thus undermine the autonomy and accountability of the anti-sexual harassment body which catered to JNU. Moreover, as you all know, the Vice Chancellor has had the premises of the GS Cash office locked, has this has led to suspension of ongoing inquiries and this has created conditions in which the human rights, confidentiality, health, physical and mental well-being and security of complainants and witnesses have been compromised. And this action has also exposed complainants and their witnesses to fresh intimidation by the accused or defendants who occupy positions of power who now feel emboldened to defy restraint orders with impunity. In committing all these actions, the Vice Chancellor has failed to fulfill the obligations of employers or persons in charge in the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act 2013. At least the, the clauses, the provisions in clauses 2, 5, 
16 and 19 have been violated by the Vice Chancellor through these actions. Now the GS cash of course was, has a long history in JNU, it was constituted in 1999. The first set of rules and procedures were approved in principle by the Executive Council in 2001 and since then there have been several revisions to the rules and regulations. Now GS cash through this journey evolved as a body constituted through electoral representation by various constituents of the university, students, staff and faculty, along with representation from various unions and associations, as well as wardens who, who are part of the inter-hostel administration. It also had external members, women academics from outside the university, and NGO representatives, all of whom had to have demonstrated experience in work on issues related to sexual harassment and this was a precondition to their inclusion into GS Cash. This unique composition has built in, had, had a built-in check against any attempt to influence inquiry processes by any person. And it had also made the GS Cash completely independent from senior levels of administrative authority, which includes the Vice Chancellor, the Rectors, the Registrar, and other top level members of the university administration. The GS Cash had three roles, gender sensitization, crisis management, and adjudication on complaints. It is for the second and third function for which the unique composition of GS Cash made it immune in some ways to any pressures from the university administration and other individuals in positions of authority. And in fact, the GS Cash rules were harmonized in 2015 with all existing law and regulation of the land after a year of very broad-based deliberations in consultation with GS Cash and all other constituents to a decision of the Executive Council and the notification of this is enclosed in the documents that we have given to you as an extra one. The exercise harmonized GS Cash with the letter and spirit of the SH Act the Burma Committee Report, the Saksham Guidelines of the UGC and the Vishakha Judgment, and firmly preserved, and yet firmly preserved the autonomy of GS Cash from manipulations by the administration or any other party by providing inherent democratic checks and balances entailed in the way it was formed and constituted, and also checks through rules and regulations on the possibility of undue interference. It may be noted that the university adopted these rules after due vetting, and this is important, and certification by its legal counsel that the new rules were compliant with the existing laws of the land. And we have attached as an extra the certification of legal compliance by the university's legal counsel. An annual report of the GS Cash of 2015-16 is also an ex to show that the GS Cash has functioned as part of these new rules in 2015-16 and as well as 2016-17. So now we are going to present to you four items of charge under the main charge of art, uh, Article 6 and I'm going to present the first two charges the and uh, Dr. Moshami Basu will present the next two. So Article 6.1 is a charge of direct interference in a complaint case against a person in position of authority. The current Vice Chancellor assumed office in the last week of January 2016. The attacks on GS Cash started immediately from February 2016 with multiple attempts of undue interference by top officials in the JNU administration in a complaint of sexual harassment on behalf of the accused or defendant who holds a position of authority in JNU. GS Cash refused to succumb to these pressures. It is important to note that the resistance to blatant misuse of power despite total commitment to gender justice would have been difficult if rules and regulations of GS Cash were lax and had loopholes. And if it had not been the newly composition that it had which actually ensured that GS Cash representatives could resist this pressure. And so we have annexed as an action four a letter from the JNU administration which instructed the GS Cash chairperson to 
drop a complaint. On 8 April 2016, the JNU administration parallelly set up a committee consisting of three members to again review GS cash rules, even though this was unnecessary, because it was just six months before that the new rules had been adopted after wide and comprehensive consultation. This committee had a dialogue with GS cash and put forward its view, and the committee submitted its recommendations, which was certified by the same legal counsel of the university, and we have annexed the report of the committee along with the opinion of the legal counsel. This annexure shows that the legal counsel had certified that the existing process of constitution of GS cash through electoral representation was not in violation of any law of the land, including the 2013 Act. This enclosure also shows that the then GS cash chairperson had pointed out that GS cash rules can be amended only in a special meeting of the GS cash and nobody else can change rules of the GS cash and it is only after this exercise that such rules can be placed before the executive council. It is important to note that these recommendations of the committee were never presented to the executive council and this exercise is actually that this was totally unnecessary is further confirmed because in December 2016 under the present vice chancellor the 2015 rules were confirmed by the court of the university and we have enclosed the minutes of the university court as annexures. Now this approval and this must be noted was done a few months after the UGC rules on prevention of sexual harassment was notified by the MHRD on May 2016. So it was a good six months after that that the present rules were actually vetted by the court and this suggests that at least till December 2016 the JNU administration had no doubt about the GS cash rules and no concern about harmony with UGC regulations. Unsuccessful in their attempt to directly and indirectly manipulate GS cash, it is from the 264th meeting of the Executive Council which was held in the summer of 2016 that different provisions of the GS cash rules were flouted and despite opposition and dissent by an elected faculty member in the Executive Council, the GS Cash was instructed by top officials of the JNU administration in writing that it should drop the case against this defendant. This included a letter from the Vice Chancellor and all of these are enclosed as an extra seven. So, in fact, what is to be noted here is that the Executive Council member who had dissented had pointed out that the Executive Council was flouting all norms and rules existent in the university which had been formulated by the Executive Council uh, by discussing this case while it was still under inquiry and thus every Executive Council member who was participating in this process was violating the clauses of confidentiality which everybody in the university is bound by. It is also important to note that an external member of the Executive Council who has been previously indicted for sexual harassment was part of this deliberation advocating actively deliberate illegal interference in GS cash matters. Now I turn to Article 6.2, which is illegal dismantling of GS cash and installation of a pliant ICC. Now, in the meanwhile, in 2017, the GS cash had received more complaints of sexual harassment, some of which involved certain members of the JNU administration. While the inquiries on these cases were on, suddenly on 4th August 2017, the administration set up yet another committee consisting of nine members yet again to review the existing mechanism of GS cash and to give the recommendations among others for forming internal complaints committee. Now this committee was comprised of an overwhelming majority of male members with no demonstrable experience of work on sexual harassment other than the same legal counsel and with no members except one who had any association with GS cash and who had demonstrated expertise and who was an ex-chairperson of GS Cash. On suggestion by this particular member that the GS Cash should be consulted and where she 
essentially wrote long interventions to point out that the nature of GS cash rules and regulations were compliant with existing laws and the process of electoral representation was immune to legal scrutiny. She was summarily uh, ignored and hence had to resign from the committee, after which her name was dropped from the committee. The legal counsel, who was notified as a member of the committee, was that same legal counsel who had said that the 2015 rules were fine and who had also said that the review that the earlier committee had done was also fine at, and the GS cash rules were in harmony with the laws of the land. Now, after all of this exercise, the Garkoti committee could not come up with any review of the GS cash, which was a substantive part of its TOR, and in the end took more than a month to copy-paste the MHRD Gazette notification for constituting a nominated ICC. Is this not wasting precious university resources and taxpayers' money? A subcommittee of this committee formulated the recommendation through a copy-paste of this MHRD uh, notification. And it was only on September 14, 2017 that the registrar in a circular informed the constituents of JNU of the existence of the Garkoti committee and we have enclosed a copy of the registrar's circular. Finally, this report of the Garkoti committee was listed as an item to note rather than an item for consideration in the agenda of the 269th Executive Council, which was held hurriedly on 18 September 2017. And even the earlier manipulated EC minutes, which had interfered in a previous case, had at least promised discussion on GS cash, while now this was merely an item to note which would have to be passed without any discussion. Dissenting members were not allowed to speak in the meeting. I have copies of an excerpts of dissents where it is very clear that six members basically showed their dissatisfaction for various reasons, including that of not being allowed to speak, and six members of the Executive Council, all three elected faculty members recorded their dissent in writing. Despite recorded dissent on the matter in writing, and without due deliberation, as it is clear from the excerpts of the dissents in writing, which are enclosed, as well as the final minutes that have been circulated now, what you find is that the ICC was announced to have been reconstituted and replaced GS Catch barely minutes after the Executive Council min, uh, meeting was over uh, by lunchtime on 18 September. This was done even before the minutes of the EC meeting had been formulated and circulated, and the minutes as on date, which are enclosed, do not reflect any of the dissent that was recorded by the six members in the 269th meeting, as well as earlier meetings. Now, if you look at certain other precedents, in Jadapur University, the Vice Chancellor had to go after accusations of mishandling a case of sexual harassment. In BHU recently, the VC had to go on long leave for mishandling a case of sexual harassment. But Annexure 15, which I just mentioned, which is the, the unratified EC minutes, read with these Article 6.1 and 6.2, together clearly establish that the decision to dismantle GS cash and replace it with the ICC was solely based on wrongful deliberations by the VC and, it, and his administration in the Executive Council to protect a powerful member of the JNU administration or members of the JNU administration from ongoing GS cash proceedings in lieu of complaints that GS Cash had received and taken up. Interestingly, the NAC report that the university filed on from between 9th and 11th October and the university website up till 1st October, a good two to three weeks after the GS Cash was said to have been dismantled, was prominently exhibited as one of the institutions of JNU which is functioning well. Thank you. Good evening. As a member of GS Cash that was uh, illegally 
dismantled. Um, I would like to draw your attention to two, uh, the two other important charges uh, that have been leveled. Article 6.3, illegal countermanding of elections to GS cash. Now, in this case, on the 12th of September, and this is at a time when uh, the GS cash was not even informed of the process. There was no written communication sent to GS cash that uh, you know the university was actually thinking of uh, incorporating and bringing about uh, this change. Uh, on 12th of September, the registrar issued a notice countermanding elections of GS cash members from various constituencies of the university and. What is interesting is that the university rules, actually section 10 of the GS cash rules, makes GS cash the only sole authority, uh, you know, in the university which will be in charge of uh, making rules regarding sexual harassment. So this whole, this um, taking over and the issuing of notices by registrar and this notice has been, um, you can look at Annexure uh, 16, um, where uh, he has sought to, uh, you know, appeal to all the associations, telling them that you know, because of this ICC uh, coming into being, uh, you know, there will be a stop on the elections. Now, it's important to note that um, in the annexure which has been given, uh, you can see that uh, it's the date is 12 uh, September. The minutes of the 268th EC meeting have yet not been finalized. They are about to be finalized. Huh? And But the registrar has overshot and has issued and brought about this notice. This meeting uh, initially was held in June um, of that year. But what is interesting is that in August, uh, the Officers Association, the JNU Officers Association, they had uh, a similar election for GS Cash, but there was no such notice issued to them. So why is it that on 12th September, this um, notice is issued? Uh, obviously, it had something to do with the student elections that had just been concluded. And we feel that uh, this circular that was issued, it was aimed solely at preventing the election of student representatives to GS Cash, which had already been announced, um, you know, uh, on 22nd September. Now. The other charge which one would like to draw your attention to is Article 6.4, illegal attempt to physically capture the GS Cash office and case files of complaints. This is a very serious charge, uh, you know, and being a witness to those events on that day, I think um, one can stand and uh, guarantee that this is how, uh, you know, it was nothing less than a uh, guest upward rate because it happened just a, a few minutes, probably in half an hour after the EC meeting had just got over, the minutes also, I mean, it did take a few days to get ready, but within half an hour of the Executive Council meeting having got over, the Chief Security Officer and security guards were there in the GS Cash office handing the chairperson of GS Cash a letter which and the letter, uh, the copy of the letter is annexed here, uh, it's there for you but the letter, all that the letter stated was that ICC had been constituted and it gave the names of the nominees whom the Vice Chancellor had put on that body. So it's interesting, the meeting takes place on the 18th September and within half an hour, even the nominees of the ICC, it's all there on paper and within half an hour the security guards are there at 
uh, the office and what do they ask for? Their first question is, hand over the keys and vacate the office space. You know, which is, that, that was how it went. The chairperson objected to this as the office order merely stated that the ICC had been constituted with the names of nominees listed on it. It did not indicate that the office had to be sealed as the CSO claimed and the keys be handed over to him. It may be noted that the keys to the GS Cash office have always been in the possession of the GS Cash office staff, chairperson or anyone authorized by her and that they have never been in the possession of the security staff of JNU. Upon the illegality of their demand being pointed out to them, the security withdrew from the premises of, to the corridor, maintaining their intimidating presence at the door. And this continued. You know, if people have seen the GS Cash room, room 114, there is a corridor in front which is usually empty. But on that day, it had security guards lined up and standing there in front of us. The GS Cash members present noted that amongst the members nominated to the new committee was one current member of GS Cash who, as per rules of GS Cash, would have to resign after giving due notice before taking up another position. As well as another nominated member was in fact also under investigation for breach of restraint in an ongoing case. Therefore, it was felt that this notification was legally fraught and required clarification from the competent authority before any further step could be taken. This was then communicated to the JNU administration via letter sent the same afternoon. Meanwhile, an office order, and there's a flurry of orders which came suddenly, uh, and this came from the registrar again which requested the chairperson to hand over charge to the chairperson ICC. And it also mentioned that time and date will be informed by Professor Vibha Tandon, chairperson ICC in due course. This was delivered from the good offices of the registrar, who once again had no locus standi in the matter. As the entire modality of the ICC notification appeared mendacious, the GS Cash office staff was then instructed by the chairperson to request other members of GS Cash and chief inquiry officers of ongoing inquiries, as well as representatives of various constituent members of GS Cash to come to the GS Cash office at the earliest. Shortly thereafter, nominated members of the newly formed ICC also walked into the office without prior communication demanding that the office and the files be handed over to them. The chairperson GS Cash explained the legally fraught implications of their position to them and in the absence of any written communication from the newly designated ICC chairperson who had also come, it was conveyed to the ICC members who had arrived uh, that GS Cash members were bound to safeguard the confidentiality of ongoing case files and other material regarding the same, and that the legality of the constitution of ICC itself was questionable, which could not be shared due to reasons of confidentiality. The haste with which such an important decision was illegally being imposed on GS Cash, you know, to say the very least, it was very intimidating. And this was conveyed to all members of the GS Cash via emails and their presence was sought by the chairperson the next day at the GS Cash premises as there was also an apprehension of an illegal locking of the GS Cash office by the JNU security which was hovering near the door. Thereafter, in the presence of several JNU security staff members, the premises of GS Cash was locked and the keys were held in the safe custody of chairperson G.S. Cash, as was routine, awaiting further instructions from the competent authority 
as no written communique had been received regarding modalities of transfer, if at all legal. On the 19th of September 2017, when the office staff arrived for work in the morning, they found the GS Cash office ingress had been blocked with a second lock over the GS Cash office lock. And the chairperson GS Cash was informed about the same. The chairperson arrived at 9.30 to look into the matter and was told by the security staff standing in the corridor that the additional lock had been put at the behest of Vice Chancellor J. New. This was further confirmed when the chairperson sought an explanation from the chief security officer shortly thereafter, who informed her that while he had received no written oath and sealed on the basis of a WhatsApp message received from the vice chancellor around 7 p.m. in the evening on the 18th of September 2017. It is true this utter disregard of legalities and procedures that a situation was created wherein the ingress and egress to the GS Cash premises was made inaccessible. Awaiting further communication, the chairperson waited all day to hear from the competent authority. Around 4 p.m., a threatening communication arrived by hand from the office of the registrar seeking that the chairperson make herself available at the GS Cash office to hand over charge to an unnamed presiding officer of the ICC. This ambiguous communication from someone with no authority regarding ICC GS Cash matters was deeply suspicious and therefore the matter was reported by her orally to the Januta which discussed the matter in its extended Januta EC meeting. The complications arising were also conveyed to the Vice Chancellor the same evening via an email sent by the chairperson GS Cash. It may also be observed that as the entire exercise of notifying an ICC had happened without even a single line of communication with GS Cash because of which it was carrying out its normal functions on the 18th of September, so complainants, witnesses, inquiry officers of an ongoing cases, etc. were present in the GS Cash office when this threatening matter to take over the GS Cash office and its confidential cases files transpired. This resulted in the intimidation of not just the office bearers of GS Cash, but also complainants who were brought face to face with defendants, thus com comprising their health and safety in the most unseemly manner. Now related to this, I would also like to put forth other examples, uh, you know, uh, where this ICC, um, how in other institutions have sought to go about uh, uh, the ICC format. Now, th just a small clarification, the UGC regulations of 2015 modified by MHRD in 2016 actually states that any existing body already functioning with the same objective like gender sensitization committee against sexual harassment should be reconstituted as the ICC. Therefore what is required uh, in practice is harmonization of GS Cash and ICC. And here I would like to draw uh, you know, your attention to some of the examples um, of how harmonization has sought to be achieved in certain institutions. For example, the gender sensitization and sexual harassment of women at the Supreme Court of India, this, uh, in, which came into force through a notification in the official gazette uh, dated August uh, 2013, that allows for both nomination as well as elections. So it says, uh, in addition to nomination of some members to this body by the CJI, it gives representation to all its constituencies and, and accepts election as a process for membership. Okay, so similarly, 
the Committee for Prevention of Sexual Harassment, constituted by the Ambedkar University, uh, that also has a 26-member committee representing all constituencies, student, faculty, non-teaching staff. And what's interesting, they're all directly elected. University of Hyderabad, in its recent order, has restricted elections only to student representatives. But it has also allowed representation from student union and teachers association. While all these institutions specific rules and regulations mentioned above have been declared to be in consonance with the sexual harassment of women at workplace, the latter two have also been declared to be in harmony with the UGC regulations 2016. What is clear from the above examples is that election as a process of membership is not ultra virus of the MHRD notification of 2016 of the UGC rules uh, of 2015 or the 2013 Act on Prevention of Sexual Harassment and has been accepted in all the instances. So the question here is why is the JNU administration determined to do away with a democratic election process which has been part of the established rules and procedures of GS Cash in JNU? Why is the JNU administration afraid of a democratically elected GS Cash teacher or staff and officers representative? Why does it want to reduce the total number of elected student representatives on the committee? Why is it not interested in a serious process of consultative harmonization of the UGC rules of 2015 with the GS Cash rules? Why is it so keen to scuttle ongoing inquiries and confiscate all papers and documents related to complaints. From our findings and evidence summarized above, it is clear that the only reason from, for all these attacks is to populate the GS Cash with the JNU administration's nominees, and thereby to influence the course and findings of inquiry committees, and thus completely scuttle the ba basis of fairness and the basic premises of gender justice. It is also clear from the above that the sole intention of this unprecedented attack on GS Cash is because the current JNU administration, led by the current Vice Chancellor, has been unsuccessful in manipulating the institution of GS Cash to scuttle inquiries against their own. Thus. The Vice-Chancellor is charged of partiality and interference in GS Cash procedures, undermining of rules and procedures in cases of complaint of sexual harassment, illegally dismantling the GS Cash in JNU and installing a pliant and puppet ICC, attempting to access and confiscate confidential case documents of GS Cash through abuse of authority and compromising the health and safety of complainants. Thus, he has not only undermined JNU's anti-sexual harassment policy, but has also made the campus unsafe for all constituents of JNU. <laughs> Sachidanan Sina and Dr. Avinash to present the Article 7, which is about uh, the Vice Chancellor's callous attitude in dealing with the uh, disappearance of Najib Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the jury, uh, I stand here to uh, present a statement in support of Article 7 of the charge memorandum displaying a careless attitude towards Najib Ahmed and failing to protect a student's interest. But before I do that, I would like to present a brief background to the kind of his community life that we see which has evolved on the campus over the last five decades. And this is very substantive and very important for us to, in fact, take note of the fact that it is this institution which is not simply a hall of residence. It is not simply the residence, residence sites for his students, 
but it's only an extension of the learning process, which in fact brings together and harmonizes what they do in their respective centers and schools with what they do within the premises of their hostels and so on and the surrounding area. If you look at the, 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 the way the campus has evolved, it is not a campus, it is certainly a campus with a difference if you try to see it with other campuses. What you see here, you do not have a student hostel sector which is separated from the residences of the faculty. The faculty, the students and the karamcharis, they coexist in the same area. The idea was that the students, when they come out, they meet their teachers, they meet, they meet their mentors, they meet their colleagues and they discuss everything under the sun. It was this idea of bringing together and creating a kind of an intellectual environment which has certainly made the difference in most of the lives, in the lives of most of us who stayed on the campus. And I can tell you for sure, I have been here for nearly 40 years like a stone in the corner which never was shown a way out. But I am now frightened. I am frightened because of the fact that what I see on the hostel premises and around is a situation of surveillance, is a situation which in fact is being created day in and day out to in fact ensure that the students don't sit outside, they don't talk with and discuss matters that is of relevance to them. They can discuss their career, they can discuss their term papers, they can discuss their, their research projects, one after another. All such sites where they sat, had a cup of tea, interacted with their colleagues, you know, without knowing as to who the person was, and so on and so forth, now they are being closed down. In the last one and a half year that we have seen, most of these sites of interaction have been closed down. Now you don't have an evening life so-called, we used to think that under the British, they used to, the sun never used to set, and this was another place where sun never used to set. Now that's all gone, but I think, you know, this is not going to continue for long. And the reason is that, you know, the spirit of community, the spirit of togetherness will certainly bring together everybody in order to, in fact, get into a kind of a sense of responsibility to protect the kind of a culture, the kind of a community culture, that community culture which, in fact, evolved through dissent to in fact evolve once again. There may have been aberrations, like it happened once in 1983, but then, you know, it further consolidated the kind of a relationship that existed between the three constituents of the university, the students, the teachers, and the karamchari. What we see here is the fact that the hostels, which in fact come under one single administrative body called the Inter-Hall Administration was a body or has been a body which in fact evolved through a decentralized mechanism. The dean of his student was the head who was a professor and he was known earlier as the dean of his student's welfare. Gradually welfare shrank and now I believe the students would also disappear. Why I am talking about this? I am talking about this precisely because, you know, the hostel affairs were solely managed by the wardens and the students themselves. With that came the sense of responsibility. It was not that, you know, a group of people sat together in one of the corner and decided about everybody. No. It was done through a process which was extremely democratic. A sense of democracy was instilled in us which brought in a sense of responsibility. A sense of responsibility which in fact saw to it that okay, there is a dissent, there is another view and that we've got to accommodate that and show that we discuss everything but we discuss with dignity. We discuss with the fact that okay, there is another view and that view must also be respected. The hostel misses were sites of discussion all through from morning until evening. You know, the hostel Miss, I think, has played the most important role in the history of JNU and democratic culture of JNU for being the site where most of the discussions in were held. You know, now, gradually, what do you find? You find a situation where the student or anybody who wants to organize 
some kind of a discussion has to in fact fill up a form and that form has to go through a long channel. Earlier, it was the hostel, it was the senior warden of the hostel who would do that. He would do that because he would take the responsibility. The signatory on the, on the, on the paper would take the responsibility who was invariably a student. A student not only of that same hostel, maybe from any other hostel. You know, because the site, the site was needed for discussion and that's what a university is meant for. Now gradually what has happened, that the role of the provost, the role of the, of the wardens, the role of different bodies, the IHA general body itself has disappeared. Now all the decisions are being taken somewhere without even having to know that, you know, these are not places where students go and sleep. These are places where they really dream their future. And that's perhaps is very important. Now, if somebody tries to shatter the dream, I think people would know how to deal with that. And that is where one can see as to what really culminated into a situation which led to Najib's disappearance. You know, I think that's very important that it was a decline in this kind of a community life. Maybe it was a very sudden decline, but that decline was largely because people were afraid. People were afraid because of the fact that you have a kind of an atmosphere in which a friend cannot go and help another friend of his or her. So, members of the jury, I'll read out some of the important points in this background. And I can tell you for sure that I have for 40 years that I was, have been on the campus, it's only in the last five years that I've not been associated with the hostel. Otherwise, I have worked at every stage, both as a student, as president of hostel, as running hostel messes, to becoming a warden and provost, and also working in the dean of his students' office for fairly long. So I have seen how this has evolved, and it has been a very pleasant journey. Uh, of course, the problems would always be there. As one of the jury members pointed out yesterday, JNU has been able to achieve its place in the academic world because of its, because it has always functioned on the basis of a sense of community. This does not mean that there has been no contradictions within the community. It rather means that this university has been created by a community of students, teachers and staff who truly represent the diversity of our country amidst great challenges. It has not been created simply with just a narrow legal framework, what Professor Patnaik termed as an ethical legal framework, a framework which actually is and should be the hallmark of all universities in true sense. A university is a highly moral space, and this morality is ensured by everybody's adherence to this ethical legal framework, which implies not just the statutes, but a whole range of conventions are respected. While the ethical legal framework and the conventions are very, very important for the academic matters of the university, it becomes more important for the community's day-to-day -day life. As was pointed out by the earlier presenters, on Article 6 on GS Cash, no law or statutes are enough and adequate to address the needs of a residential university like that of JNU. And hence the community has to evolve, and it did evolve its own mechanism to address the contradictions within it. GS Cash became a model. And I must point out at this stage that in fact, while the GS Cash rules and regulations were framed in 1999, the process started much earlier. In fact, even in the absence of GS Cash, I can give you a number of such instances, and I remember where institutions like this were from time to time created, you know, although on a temporary basis, to in fact look into similar complaints, not only just look into complaints, but also ensure that there is a certain sense of responsibility the boys and girls have towards each other. Now, GS Cash became a model. So is the social life of JNU, a model for campuses not just within the country, but across the world. Anybody who has got an opportunity to witness the community life in JNU, except the present 
Vice Chancellor Professor M. Jagadesh Kumar has actually cherished and praised it, its richness. I wish Professor Kumar was not an exception. The JNU community in the last five decades has successfully built a strong and academically vibrant atmosphere, which provides appropriate encouragement for sound and fruitful relationships between the intellectual and social life of the students and for those aspects of the university life outside the classroom which contribute to their growth and development as mature and responsible human beings. All those who have been associated with JNU always call it their second home, a home filled with warmth and cozy people and, with, and people whom we call the JNU community. I mean, you must have seen that even during the summer break and the winter break, the hostels are just having the same number of people. They just don't go home. In fact, that is what one of the major complaints people make from home. What has happened to you, JNU? Why don't you come home in vacation? However, this does not mean that the university does not have provisions for this. And it is here that I would like to remind all of us that As the Article 10, one of the second schedule of the JNU Act 1966 states the Dean of Students is one of the officers of the university who is appointed by the Executive Council on the recommendation of the Vice Chancellor and the power of the Dean of Students governed by the academic ordinances in its clause 11 approved by resolution number such and such clearly states the following that the dean of his students in the university shall look after the general welfare of his students as also provide appropriate encouragement and sound and fruitful relationship between the intellectual and social life of the students and for those aspects of the university life outside the classroom which contribute to their growth and development as mature and responsible human beings. You know, this exactly is not being done in the last few months, one and a half year. I would now request my colleague to in fact spell out further of uh, Article 7. Thank you very much. I stand before you to present and support, speak in support of Article 7 with a very heavy heart. With a heavy, very heavy heart because uh, it has been 374 days since Najib went missing on the 15th of October last year and we do not have any clue what has happened to Najib, where is he. So what we are going to present will testify that the way the present Vice Chancellor Professor M. Jagadesh Kumar has dealt with the issue of Najib has certainly failed to uphold and implement not just the statutory provisions but also the what was quoted as ethical legal framework to ensure protection of the entire JNU community. On October 15, 2016, Najib Ahmed, a first year student of the MSc program at the School of Biotechnology, went missing from his room in a hostel of the university. The night before, Najib was assaulted by a group of students within the hostel premises. The Vice Chancellor and his administration's callousness have been directly responsible for the circumstances behind a student of the university going missing from the university campus. The hostel administration not only failed to protect Najib from being assaulted, but projected him in a bad light in its first meeting held after that. In any such case, when the while the convention of JNU has been to issue show cause notices to anybody engaged in violence inside the hostel premises, the hostel administration, under the pressure of the assaulters, instead pronounced Najib guilty and ordered his immediate hostel transfer without any proper inquiry. As reported in the article of charge on GSCAS earlier, while the university administration has been enthusiastically making video recordings of all the events inside campuses and including today's, I'm sure about that. Uh, uh, there was no video recording done of this assault on Najib. Despite the university security, heavy presence of university security, nor did the JNU administration 
show any excitement this time like they did you know ironically even just a few months before in reporting the incident to the police the vice chancellor professor m jagadesh kumar did not issue any statement after the incident the jnu administration in the in its first press release on october 17 almost 48 hours after the incident and the disappearance of najib instead issued a, 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 a an appeal to najib instead of issuing an appeal to najib guaranteeing him full security and justice by punishing those who were involved in assaulting him addressed najib as an accused and i have attached an extra one for that why did the jnu administration choose to ignore the warden's committee report which was dated 16th october 2016 where it had categorically mentioned about the brutal assault on najib remains unanswered even today without conducting conducting an inquiry the jnu administration jnu administration's action was only in contravention of the principles of natural justice which calls for fair hearing of all parties involved it not only would have potentially added fear in the minds of najib but also in the minds of several other students particularly those belonging to the marginalized sections of the inside the university campus in fact such acts of partisanship from the very beginning only indicated towards a deliberate prejudice against najib and put serious questions on the jnu administration's objectivity the vice chancellor and his administration further lowered the prestige of the university by the way they treated the family of najib ahmed despite being aware of the fact that najib's family had arrived in the campus on october 15 the day he had disappeared uh, the vc did not even show the basic human emotion by talking with or meeting najib's family for the next four consecutive days the family finally had to force their way into the vc's office on october 7, 18 however the response that they got from the vice chancellor and his administration only showed their insensitivity towards najib and his family and i have attached the annexe 2 you know substantiating this the jnu administration neither filed a missing complaint which could have led to a totally different protocol of search and investigation nor did it file a complaint against the assaulters of najib to give him justice the demand of the jnu community both students and teachers to have a fair inquiry into did not pay any heed any response from the vice chancellor the jnu administration in its press release on october 26 nearly 10 days after once again did not mention the assault on mr najib by a group of students this clearly indicated that the administration was trying to protect and give clean chit to the assaulters of najib in advance the vice chancellor and his team did not show any seriousness in conducting an impartial inquiry in the incidents of violence let alone protect those who were feeling threatened by the perpetrators of mob violence inside the university campus while the university administration announced that a proctorial inquiry has been initiated it also made a complete mockery of the rules of the university by announcing that the proctorial inquiry report would be submitted to the provost committee for its recommendations this further confirmed that the real objective of the university was not to do justice with najib ahmed but to delay any action in an extremely shocking move the administration in its zeal to unnecessarily sensationalize the issue in its press release release dated summary and update of the events tried to link this issue with a bag of containing pistol found at the north gate of the university almost a month later and i've attached the annex of that the administration in order to delay the process further initiated proctorial inquiries against the students who were demanding justice for najib after his disappearance with no response from the jnu administration the family of najib was left with no option and filed a writ petition in the delhi high court on october november 21st 2016 but when the case was taken up for hearing the jnu administration did not appear before the court or submit any response the delhi high court expressed displeasure at this this attitude of the vice chancellor for not assigning anyone in the matter despite being served a copy of the petition it further said and it was directing the vice chancellor he does not think it is an important matter this is not a good attitude i am told and asked the jnu administration to file a response to the petition 
have attached a lecture of the Telegraph newspaper report. Shameful was the fact that despite the proctoral inquiry issued show cause notices to those identified as Najib's assaulter, the annexure 4 and annexure 5 says that, they did not declare anybody guilty of any misconduct or indiscipline and were simply let off simply by a hostile transfer order by the JNU administration. Again, the annexure 7, the report of the proctoral inquiry is attached. The asymmetry of the punishment can be witnessed from the fact that the same JNU administration found six students, including all JNU SUF bearers, guilty of misconduct and indiscipline for seeking justice for Najib. And the punishment for this case included, along with the hostile transfer, an imposition of a fine of rupees 20,000 on each student and blocking their academic process. A simple order of that is attached again as an extra eight. The investigation by the Delhi police did not lead the case anywhere and hence the Delhi High Court on a plea by Najib's mother in, 19, in May 2017 transferred the investigation from the police to the CBI. However, three months later in August, when CBI failed, of, uh, failed to file a fresh progress report in the case, the High Court rebuked it and said, uh, saying the probe was not transferred to the agency for fun. But despite six months into investigation, the CBI has not led us anywhere till date. Hearing the plea on October 16, 2017, the High Court expressed unhappiness with against his probe into Najib's disappearance and came out heavily on the contradictions that appeared in CBI's oral submissions and status report. So the status today, today stands that we do not have any clue what and where is Najib. So in what we have presented above, it is clear that the way Professor M. Jagadish Kumar has dealt with the issue of Najib only shows that he has no respect at all for what we term as the JNU community. The charge, therefore, is that he has failed to protect the community life from the threats which have been arising repeatedly ever since he has joined this university as the Vice Chancellor. Thank you. We will now uh, <clears throat> present uh, defense for the Vice Chancellor that we have prepared. Uh, these are his assertions that he time and again issues through various notices. So may I now request uh, Dr. Amitabh to uh, present uh, the defense for uh, the Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Pradeep. Uh, this is a defense statement on behalf of the Vice Chancellor. Uh, the first uh, uh, defense statement is, is as follows. JNU is not above the law of the land and therefore compliance of the sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention and prohibition, prohibition and redressal act 2013 and the implementation of the university grants commission prevention of prevention prohibition and redressal of sexual harassment of women employees and students in higher educational institutions was imperative the second point in the light of letters received from the ugc the executive council authorized the vice chancellor to initiate the process of constituting an icc it may be noted that the ugc regulations stipulate that the internal complaints committee icc means internal complaints committee to be constituted by an hei higher educational institutions under sub-regulation 1 of the regulation 4 of these regulations, any existing body already functioning with the same objective like the Gender Sensitization Committee Against Sexual Harassment, GS Cash, should be reconstituted as the ICC. As such, replacement of the GS Cash by the ICC was necessary and therefore there was no question of the process being done through GS Cash rules and procedures. It also followed that the Garkoti Committee's mandate was simply to examine what amendments were needed in JNU's rules to bring them in line with the prevailing legal provisions. The composition of the committee was accordingly decided and there is no basis for questioning the credential of its members. Since the implementation of UGC regulations was mandatory without any deviation and the regulations themselves spelt out the severe penalties the university was in danger of inviting, if it failed to comply with them, including stoppage of grants from the UGC and the government, the EC accepted the recommendations of the Garkoti Committee as a result of which the GS cash ceased to have any statutory basis and it continued 
functioning and its continuing functioning would be illegal. As such, the documents and papers of the GS cash needed to be transferred to the custody of the ICC. Following the Executive Council's decision, the provisions of sub-regulation 1 of the regulation 4 of the UGC regulations, which specify the composition of the ICC and the mode of selection of its members, also come into force. The constitution of the new ICC is in accordance with these provisions which mandate that the executive authority, which in JNU's case is its exec executive council, shall nominate the presiding officer from among women faculty members as well as two other faculty members and two non-teaching employees and one NGO member. The EC only carried out this mandate to the best of its knowledge. The individuals chosen meet the criteria laid down in the regulations. The elections for the student members of the ICC have also been conducted. Finally, as regards the exempt EC giving directions to the GS cash on individual enquiries before receiving a report is concerned, it may be that statute 1410 allows the EC to entertain, adjudicate, and if it thinks fit to redress any grievances of the salaried officer, the teaching staff, and other employees of the university who may for any reasons feel aggrieved. It is under this provision that the EC acted on a representation received from a teacher, charges against whom are being looked into by the GS cash in violation of its own rules, was examining a case that was more than three years old. In view of what has been said above on serial number one to six, that is the entire statement, it is clear that the, if the vice chancellor is guilty of anything, it is of adhering to the laws of the land and not the charge mentioned under Article 6 of the Charge Memorandum. As regards Charge 7 of the Charge Memorandum, which Dr. Avinash and Professor Sachi mentioned, the summary and updates uh, document, update documents issued by the Dean of Students' Office documents the tremendous efforts put in by JNU administration keeping the best interest of the missing student in mind. They speak for themselves. As regards disciplinary action against students allegedly involved in assaulting Najib are concerned, the following may be noted. All disciplinary cases involving students are dealt with as per the rules and norms by the chief proctor's office and punishments are given in proportion to the offense that they are found guilty of. The same was followed in this particular instance too. As such, there is no basis for charge. And something that is uh, not written in this uh, statement is that, forgive me for being the devil's advocate. Thank you.